Maria, thank you very much. And uh, Maria will speak about IPF and COVID-19 and the Spanish experience. Thank you, Antonio. And thank you, the organizers, for, uh, for uh, the invitation. For, uh, it's a pleasure to participate in this uh, webinar. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, the fear of uh, COVID-19 for our patients. I guess that this is a picture of uh, ourselves uh, in February when we know, when we knew about uh, the COVID-19. Uh, as we know, this COVID-19 induces severe uh, respiratory failure. And uh, we know that in our IPF cases, acute exacerbation may be the cause of death of our patients. The mortality of an acute, a severe acute exacerbation is very high. So uh, it's easy to, uh, to be um, afraid with this situation for our patients. Furthermore, we have to think about uh, the target of coronavirus and the pathways that uh, these coronavirus are inducing. And if we uh, keep in mind this cell target and pathway activation, uh, we know that uh, this virus is able to induce some uh, growth factors and uh, cytokines that are implicated also in the profibrotic answer. And finally, how we can manage our IPF patients in a time of confinement, in a, in a time of uh, lockdown. So um, these four questions were the main ones for our IPF cases. Uh, later on, two months later, we understood that uh, when there is no scientific evidence, we only can apply the common sense and anticipating potential problems and uh, pro potential solutions. Uh, probably all of you have already seen this figure for many, many uh, times. Um, and I only want to focus uh, on the special um, relevance of pulmonology and uh, especially the ILD community in this pandemia, in the stage two and the stage three of the acute phase, but also in those cases that, has, uh, that have been previously, previously shown radiologically that uh, present some uh, uh, pulmonary sequela after the recovery of the acute phase. Uh, at the beginning of the, the pandemic, we didn't, we couldn't perform CT scans because uh, uh, tsunami of patients that we had, we didn't know how to manage the CT scan space um, for, for these cases, but uh, uh, little by little, we could perform some of these cases, uh, some of these uh, radiological tests, and uh, this um, journal, yeah. this manuscript, helped a lot to ask for more CT scans in uh, those cases that uh, had a special, an special requirement of uh, oxygen and also presented functional impairment after the acute phase. And uh, I, I would recommend uh, this uh, manuscript of the Fletcher Society. Uh, due to this fact, uh, we performed uh, in, in all recovered base patients um, a CT scan, and uh, this is a, an example of uh, one case of last week. Um, initially, we saw that uh, we, we only had problems in the acute phase, but I guess that uh, we will have some problems uh, in a minority of cases that will recover. And this is an example. Uh, another point is uh, uh, regarding the fear of COVID-19 for pulmonary fibrosis um, is the target, the cell target that this virus has in the cell. As you can see here, this is uh, a work performed almost more than, more than 10 years ago, and in which uh, we uh, understood the role of uh, angiotensin peptides as a potential profibrotic growth factors in pulmonary fibrosis. When you have more H2 and you have more H17, you are more protected or is antifibrotic um, in, uh, in the preclinical studies. Uh, but when you have more H2 and H1, 
This is prophagrotic in the preclinical studies. And in our patients, we know that we have more uh, ACE2 yeah. in the normal population and less ACE2 mm -hmm. in patients. So regarding this, look at the entry in the cell of the coronavirus. This is the, um, the receptor of coronavirus, the S protein of ACE2 enzyme. So um, this is a, a big fear for a, a future prophylactic cancer. But unexpectedly, uh, as, uh, as uh, it was seen in COPD, in our, our ILDs uh, came less than expected to the hospital. These are only data from our hospital. Uh, Dr. Claudia Valenzuela is leading a national uh, study with thousands of patients uh, looking for which of them were uh, ILD before the hospitalization. And as you can see here, uh, um, we only had 21 cases hospitalized from 2050 uh, global hospitalized cases with COVID-19. Most of them were, um, curiously, uh, CDP ILD. Only four were IPF. The age ranged from 38 to 78 years uh, old. Only four of them died, so the mortality is uh, around 20%, but uh, it's similar to other uh, chronic diseases uh, for COVID-19. Uh, but 14 presented radiological worsening after discharging. So we have more work with these cases in the future, probably in the follow-up. Uh, and we asked uh, about the potential explanation and we could um, hypothesize three main points. The first one is that uh, chronic respiratory patients uh, usually protect themselves more than other patients. Uh, we, they, they use um, probably masks before uh, other, other subjects and also uh, stay at home before. And uh, it is clear that at least in our hospital, we started telematic visits before, at, at least two weeks ago than the other medical departments. So maybe it could protect them too. The other point is that, um, as I show you, the angiotensin system in pulmonary fibrosis is uh, dysregulated. And as, I do, as, as you can see here, patients with IPF present less ACE2 enzyme than patients at the same age, but uh, with no problems in the lung. And as you can see here, ACE2 is localized in type two cells, as you can, see, you can see here in these pictures. And in our IPF patients, these receptors, I, these enzymes are not present. And the third hypothesis is the potential uh, prevention of, uh, of these patients that are being treated with antifibrotic medications because uh, these medications may also uh, have some um, effect on uh, COVID-19. But uh, uh, these three points are only hypotheses. And the last point is uh, how to manage um, our patients during a lockdown situation? Well, uh, we performed all visits uh, telematically. We follow with the uh, multidisciplinary committees by video conference, by using Zoom and Teams. We also started working with eHealth tools um, to try to maintain our patients um, in their programs, especially their physical activity programs. Uh, uh, considering the medication, usually they are coming to the hospital to give, I do take the medication. In these months, we send the medication uh, uh, home, to their homes. And also in, in the case of clinical trials, we had some clinic, some home care nurses that came that that uh, went to the to patients' home uh, for uh, for uh, the blood tests. But the big challenge was uh, maintain or persisting in the monitoring of the disease by itself, uh, because all, you already know the difficulty during the pandemic for using CT scans and especially performing 
pulmonary functional test that uh, it was not allowed in, to our patients, of course, for, uh, for uh, safety um, reasons. The good thing is that uh, before the pandemic, we had some interesting uh, studies that, pre that uh, presented good results by using home monitoring uh, of IPF patients. And uh, probably we accelerated the introduction of these e-health tools with our patients. Uh, fortunately, we have a society that is working hard always, which is the British Thoracic Society. And, uh, and they, uh, they were um, publishing, they published a lot of very good work in this pandemic, trying to recommend some, uh, some points for special situations uh, like uh, ILDs. In, uh, in this case, they recommended uh, telematic visits. Uh, in patients with IPF, um, they recommended to maintain antifibrotic drugs, not reducing the dose. And if the patient uh, presented COVID-19 infection, also keeping the medication at the same dose, uh, except for those cases that uh, had to be intubated and ventilated, that then uh, they can't uh, receive oral medication. And finally, um, uh, as you can see here, in these cases with, uh, that, that, that they had to stop the oral medication after recovering, uh, they recommended to early start, restart again the medication. And what are we doing now in the, in this, um, at this moment uh, in the post-COVID era? Uh, so we are trying to initiate antifibrotic drugs uh, in those new cases uh, in which we had to delay the treatment because they couldn't come. Uh, we, also, we also increased the activity in clinical trials, trying to include all as, as many as uh, possible patients in these clinical trials right now and for the next two, three months. Uh, and of course, we have a team only focused on calling on uh, video, video um, uh, calling these patients to be sure that they are properly, if uh, properly, uh, they are uh, good, they are well, and if they are not as as good as uh, we want, they have to come to visit us during the summer time. So uh, I will finish with these questions for all of you because um, what uh, I realized is that um, we we had no problems to. Um, diagnose COVID cases in a COVID pandemic. But what, what will happen in the future when these patients can come in any, uh, at any situation, at any um, moment during the year uh, and they may present radiologically different pictures. And uh, in some cases, these pictures are very similar to non-infection ILD cases so maybe in the future, we have to think about these, uh, these uh, pictures for the, diag the differential diagnosis in the ILD committee, probably. So in conclusion, uh, less IPF patients than expected were hospitalized in this pandemic. Antifibrotic medication shouldn't be modified in, uh, in our IPF patients, fortunately. And even uh, we can think about a potential rough role of antifibrotic medication for protecting them. Um, and uh, the third point is that uh, we've uh, learned a lot about e-health tools, and now probably we have to accelerate the use of these e-health tools. Thank you very much.